the audience has the floor. So time for Q&A. Who has a question? Uh, the um, mics. You, you, are allowed, you are allowed to ask any question you want, as long as you are a woman. <laughs> I am not joking. <laughs> I am not joking. OK. Any woman? Hey, okay. shoot. No, 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 we, we, we can wait. Okay. And, 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 and this is a problem. Not only the women are very few in numbers here, but I am sure you have a lot of questions. And the fact that you are not asking them is something that is an interesting question itself, right? Ah, oh, there, there you go. Yes. Why are you so interested in hearing from women? <laughs> Um, well, um, uh, I, I, I think that uh, it is quite important to uh, create inclusive societies and we cannot exclude 50 plus percent of, uh, of the population in having conversations about how the future is going to look like. We have to design it and implement it together. So if all these men go home, and the wife or the girlfriend asks them, hey, how was your evening? And he says, it was amazing or not amazing, whatever he says, she is not participating at the level that she should. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that it is very, very important to, to have women actively participate in the process. Another question. And I like women. <laughs> Sir, can you please elaborate or summarize in brief the, uh, the single uh, argument for the 10,000 year mistake, the title of your lecture? Um, technology enabled us to develop methods for solving many, many problems, and we overcame mystical, dogmatic, metaphysical explanations for natural phenomena. And as a consequence, we were able to be much better in the things that we wanted to do. Our current explanations for uh, our moral behavior for the vast majority of the people are based on mystical, dogmatic and metaphysical assumptions that reduce drastically our capacity for moral action. Since the machines that are going to be autonomous and take moral action by themselves are not going to be inspired by the mystical, dogmatic and metaphysical basis of our morality, they will not be able to make the decisions in a sound fashion we have to offer them an alternative. And as a consequence, we first have to develop a science and then we can implement an engineering of morality. Over there, in the back. Please speak out loud. That, that, that sounded like a book uh, cover, right? <laughs> Good we are recording this because I have to write it down. <laughs> Yeah, great. No, I have a quick question about, uh, there's a little talk about exponential technology. Um, there's a little talk about the exponential development of human consciousness. And especially there's a little talk of the relationship between both of them. My question is, what do you see uh, as the relationship between both developments? Yeah, so... Can you repeat the question because of the... Why don't you? The question is, so we have exponential technology, right? So what about exponential consciousness and exponential wisdom, basically, right? What is your take on that? So, um, there is a lot of wisdom in, in, in all the culture that humanity created. And before um, a couple of centuries, at best, all this wisdom 
was isolated. Some of it even disappeared without leaving a trace or we were uh, very busy destroying civilizations uh, without caring for what kind of wisdom we could uh, take from them. Uh, preserving this kind of wisdom, languages, cultures, um, and, and making sure that uh, they have a place in uh, informing our future thinking is, is of extreme importance and we have the means, we have the opportunity to do so. Even if something as humble as going with a tape recorder or audio recorder or video recorder uh, to tribes that are disappearing and, and, and probably they will disappear, we cannot even stop, it from stop them from disappearing, uh, sourcing, collecting, uh, understanding their heritage uh, is, is, is of uh, an immense importance. On the other hand, uh, we are biological and uh, it, our brain works the same. Uh, in 10,000 years it didn't change. Uh, our uh, instincts, our um, speed of thought uh, are the same. The fact that this is true is demonstrated by the struggles that we have as individuals in understanding the world as we grow up into it. Uh, the universe is a black box for each of us when we start and we enjoy uh, the, the sonnets of Shakespeare or, or other uh, poems or, or um, pieces about love and, and the challenges of living. The, the reason is because we cannot bootstrap ourselves and overcome that. We have to acquire that kind of knowledge individually, right? Um, basically, we are closed source to ourselves. And we know that now that open source is superior to closed source. Uh, Twitter, Google, Facebook couldn't exist without open source approaches in developing their software and now even hardware. And open source consciousness is what artificial intelligence and robotics is going to be about. And their level of introspection and self-awareness is going to be vastly superior than ours. So those of us who are going to be able to embrace uh, that kind of open source consciousness through necessarily technological means, not in a mystical fusion, but uh, just the way uh, I am wearing glasses today because otherwise I couldn't see you and uh, some of you are tweeting or, or, you know, this is spreading our ideas around, uh, our consciousness will lock uh, and, and be bootstrapped and, and actually it will be a rocket engine uh, firing up our consciousness uh, together with uh, those of the AIs. Of course, no here. What do you mean with uh, uh, closed Closed source versus yeah, open source. Yes, and, and related to human consciousness. How do you, what do you mean exactly? Well, um, um, we still don't know how the brain works, right? And, and there are people who believe that actually uh, human consciousness is not an expression of the brain. Yes. There are people who believe that there is a soul like uh, uh, that is separate. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, those people people have to offer an alternative path for actionable outcomes. Personal growth and meditation is fine, but it is not scalable. Uh, it is not going to be the one that solves our problems. It hasn't been, uh, and, uh, and uh, it is a, an individual practice, but uh, you, you will actually not stop a, an army by, by meditating. Um, now, I do believe that we can have a means of communication and arriving to a common understanding of our differences and our similarities, uh, and that this channel of communication is being built and lived by billions of people every day. It's called the internet, it's called Facebook, it's called email, it's called Skype. P 
people who know each other through those means are less likely to kill each other. Uh, however, uh, when, what I mean about closed source is that uh, by meditating you will not discover your DNA. By meditating you are not going to um, repair your genetic defects or you are not going to cure your mental illness as we uh, describe it. And, and this is, you know, this is just my worldview uh, and it is very specific. Um, and I'm sure the Pope prays when he's ill. Maybe he also calls a doctor. So I think that uh, uh, there is room for the scientific worldview even in those who have a metaphysical worldview. Uh, and as far as open source is concerned, as opposed to closed source, it simply means, simply, it is not simple at all, but it means that uh, if you subscribe to uh, projecting outwards the evolution of our software and hardware systems, and uh, you accept that we are delegating more and more decisions to them, it is useful and necessary to endow them not only with decision-making but an understanding of their own workings. Because if we do, then they can um, make themselves better at the task that we give them, just like the Google robotic cars by night. And that is what it means open source, that they can look into themselves and how they are and what they are for and, and go towards their goals. Well, if I can comment on that, because uh, in my opinion, there should be way more uh, uh, people looking at consciousness and as the way that we're looking at technology and exponential technologies, if we could focus more on consciousness and not only referring to meditation or religion or stuff like that and connect that to technology and exponential technology that would be an interesting subject. Uh, yeah and, and, and there is a researcher that uh, you may want to look up uh, her name is uh, Susan Blackmore. Mm. Uh, she is, is, is a scientist and uh, she applied scientific methodology to uh, study uh, phenomena that are typically not studied by scientists, psychic phenomena, out-of-body experiences, mm -hmm. exactly in order to connect um, states of consciousness to predictable means of analyzing them through technology. And so you may want to, to, to look at her conclusions. Well, I just introduced a new community called Consciousness Hacking in the Netherlands. So I'm looking into that. Before. Wonderful. And, and uh, you know, if, if you prove that the soul exists, I will be happy to embrace that. I am not out to prove that the soul doesn't exist. I just don't base my um, plans on, on, on it. Uh, and of course, it's, it's fine. Next question over there. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so, uh, so the development of our technological means to, to kill each other is also exponential. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, basically there haven't been wars for the past 50 years. The only wars were fought by uh, America, 
uh, and uh, uh, the Soviet Union, basically in the same place, Afghanistan, for some reason, uh, and, and then uh, Iraq. Uh, but all the other uh, conflicts are either tribal uh, or uh, civil wars. And, and tribal wars between nations are basically just borders that are too straight. That is what I was referring to. They are, they are wrong borders that the different tribes should want to set straight. And civil wars are, are uh, dysfunctional societies where the people uh, are, are so mad that they are ready to die in order to change uh, things. Uh, and, and I think that in the future, uh, civil conflict is also going to be um, uh, much harder. Uh, our capacity to uh, uh, wreak havoc is, is, is increasing. Um, uh, genome sequencing is nothing uh, compared to what we are capable of uh, and starting to accelerate to uh, genome printing. Uh, you can order uh, synthetic viruses and, and synthetic uh, uh, bio bricks, as they are called, uh, over the internet. You just have software to, to design it. And uh, we have to be very careful in, in you know, what are the demons that we are unleashing. Um, and, and I don't have perfect solutions, right, for uh, predicting exactly how we are going to stop somebody printing uh, um, the Ebola virus or, or whatever other pathogen and spreading it around. I actually met a, um, a startup in Geneva uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, they are building uh, a, a real-time sensor for arbitrary complexity, unknown pathogens, biological pathogens, uh, basically uh, a, a physical antivirus machine. And uh, it is still very expensive, about $200,000, $300,000 each, but they believe it will be everywhere and the price is going to go down. So uh, uh, probably there are cameras here, security cameras somewhere. In a few years, we will have security bio scanners uh, everywhere, which will be one means of stopping somebody doing something very stupid. Uh, going back to the question of the nation state, uh, the nation state is going to be outcompeted. It is not going to disappear. It will just stop being the place where things happen. This is already the case in Europe, um, except in the wrong direction, uh, because the, the decisions are made at the EU level rather than at the, at the national level, right? So the nation state doesn't m matter much. Um, the, the analogy is uh, bacteria. For two billion years, bacteria were the dominating life form on the planet. And according to some measures, they still are. But bacteria are never going to dream about colonizing Mars. And so the nation state is going to be limited, and we will uh, dream about things that, that they will just look at and, and be amazed. Hey, final two questions over here. Yeah? Please give a brief answer. Thanks. Impossible. <laughs> The question is, do the organizations become more B Corp companies uh, time? Yes, uh, I, I basically believe that uh, uh, there it, it will be impossible not to, that every company will be, and then whether by law or by fact, but that is how they will act. And, uh, and a lot of uh, buying decisions are going to be based on that. Um, Companies, companies um, have shown that they can be obsessed about growth and profit that not only harms society, they can be so obsessed that uh, a company can say, 
you have to violate the physical laws of reality to an engineer that goes on and designs an engine for a car that has a workaround because he cannot violate the laws of physics but the CEO or the chairman said so, so it must be done and it doesn't matter if a hundred year old brand is going to be destroyed in the process so much that it has to advertise on television the new cars without naming the brand and showing the logo or the jingle because it is ashamed of itself. And, and, and that is what happened to Volkswagen. Uh, so recognizing that growing at all costs is not only bad for society, but it can kill the company too. And even more, with robotic cars, there will be no car stopped ever. All the cars will be moving around. And there are projections showing that we will need 80-90% fewer cars. So actually, it is not only um, uh, harmful, it is even stupid because it is going in the wrong direction. Cars should be like Apple, trying to make money in selling fewer rather than more. A question over there? Yeah. Like I feel a kind of large or big um, responsibility for the future as a designer. How do you think designers and design practice as a whole should develop in relation to exponential technology? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the role of designers uh, has been um, relegated or misunderstood in the past to be about visual appeal or the product functionality in very limited fashion. Uh, but once again, I look at it in a much more generalized form. Uh, you design um, not only shapes and, and function, you design structures, you design policies, you design currencies, you design legislation, uh, constitutions, um, uh, space missions, uh, new planetary colonization. Um, each of these can happen with our eyes uh, closed and we just think it will work out fine or we can think ahead and make specific decisions that are informed by good design, right? Um, and uh, that is why we just uh, have been fortunate and uh, at Network Society Ventures we added um, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the, the heads of uh, uh, the design practice at uh, Automatic, uh, the makers of uh, WordPress, as an advisor uh, to Network Society Ventures, because we believe that uh, investment decisions, startups, uh, and the, the, the future in general should be evaluated based on their good design as well. One final question. Over there. Yeah. Um, will there be a time that humans are useless? Will there be a time when humans will be useless? Interesting question. And closing. So, so um, the fascinating part about this question is that we will be able to answer that individually uh, as well. Um, there are. Uh, people who are working on radically prolonging biological life, uh, others who are even talking about being able to back up and then restore consciousness uh, in different substrates. Uh, and uh, at that point it will be incredible because many will start living lives rather than in sequence, in parallel, and uh, so different experiences and choices will be made. And then I envision that getting together ritually, maybe once a year or once a decade, merging experiences, purging what doesn't 
what is not needed. There will be actually only two of those uh, instantiations of the individual that won't come back. One of them will be uh, the one that chose uh, to die, which will be the only way to be making a conscious decision to do so. And the other is going to be the one who decided to leave the solar system and couldn't be bothered. And, and uh, yes, uh, many of you will participate in this uh, type of, in these types of, of, of living. And it is up to us to ask whether that kind of future and those people are still human or not. And it is a challenge because we can decide today to apply a very restrictive definition of what it means to be human. And there has been a past where I would have been burned at the stake because I have a, uh, the glasses. And when I show my implant, uh, to, to, to people and I ask them to touch it under my skin, uh, a lot of them recoil in horror. They pass a boundary where they stop empathizing with me and they, they start to see, wow, what, what is this guy anyway, right? And, and, and so there will be moments in the future where we'll be tempted to restrict what it means to be human uh, as a, as a, as a constraining definition, but we shouldn't. We should open up this definition to as broad a variety of ways of living as possible and substrates and, and, and you know, I wish we would be bold enough to call AIs and robots human as fast as possible. Because if we give them uh, the respect before they claim it, then they will hopefully pay us back by respecting us too. And then those who don't choose to live in strange ways that they don't recognize that they could accept will be okay. And they will be in a planet in numbers that potentially are far uh, outstripped by quadrillions of other humans in, in, in many different forms, but the traditional human form will be respected, useful and, and, and dignified too. And it depends on us and it depends on the choices we make today. With that, a closing and a big hand for David Orban. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.